Thank you very much. As Dr. Robert said, before I came to Aspatar, um, one of my subspecialties was in uh, device therapy. And so I'd like to share with you today my experiences of um, ICDs in the population in general, but also in the younger population and, in, and specifically in athletes. So I'll just give you an outline of the talk. We'll give you an introduction first to set the scene really, and then we'll talk about the history of ICDs, um, their structure and function so you can understand how they work a little bit about the implantation procedure so that you understand what the athletes need to go through when they have one of these devices put in. We'll talk about the indications for implantation <coughs> of ICDs in athletes and also what happens when things go wrong, the complications that can arise. There are guidelines for participation in sport and we'll discuss those. Along with things that you need to know if you do have an athlete with um, an ICD. So we all are aware about the problem of sudden cardiac death in athletes. It can occur at any time to any athlete. And I'd just like to show you briefly, some of you may have already seen this video of what happens when an athlete has a cardiac arrest. His eyes are open, he's still breathing. This player didn't receive any cardiac resuscitation at the time, or indeed at the pitch side afterwards, because Really, nobody understood what was happening to him, and unfortunately, he didn't survive. Times have changed, and there's a very high-profile case more recently of Fabrice Mwamba, who suffered a cardiac arrest on the pitch. This was recognized immediately, and he received quite prolonged resuscitation on the pitch and afterwards, and he went on to receive um, an ICD, which is the device we're going to talk about today, although he hasn't returned to training. <coughs> But there are a number of professional football players who have actually returned to competitive sport at a professional level with devices in situ. And I think the first player was Kalilou Fadiga in 2004. And at the time, this was the, this was the view of his team doctor. He should live his life quietly and give up playing football. It's dangerous for him to want to continue playing. The defibrillator is a device that can stop just as easily as it can start. The machine is so delicate that if he takes a, a hit from a ball, it will stop functioning and lead to his instant death. And this was the perception at the time. But of course, the player wasn't having any of it. I just want to play football. So he carried on. This was 11 years ago now. Since then, there have been uh, more players that have gone on to continue their professional career having had suffered cardiac arrest and had defibrillators implanted. And this is what it looks like when a football player... Er is vlak voor rust op Schiervelde als Roeselare verdediger Anthony van Loo plotseling in elkaar... I'll just turn the sound off actually for this, I think. Or not, as the case may be. Well, you can listen to it. Some of you may... Er is vlak voor rust op Schiervelde als Roeselare verdediger Anthony van Loo plotseling in elkaar zakt en voor dood blijft liggen. Ik ging achter die bal aan, maar ineens voelde ik het niet goed. Ik kreep naar mijn hoofd en, uh, en in drie seconden lag ik neer, zo gezegd. En dan, uh, dan weet ik totaal niks meer van de wereld. Je lag er vlak en een seconde of drie, vier, misschien vijf seconden nadien, een shock, je hebt er praktisch van de grond. En je kunt zien... ...dat je gets up very quickly afterwards. And I think what's important to note from this video is that when the player actually goes down, you can see he's in contact with the player when he receives the shock from his device, but he doesn't actually come to any ill harm. And this is quite an important point to note. So what about the history of ICDs then? They were first developed, well, the development of ICDs began way back in 1969. And the first device was implanted in a dog six years later. The first human implant occurred in 1980. And the devices received FDA approval five years after that. This is the first paper that was published in 1980, talking about three successful cases of ICD implantation. 
And there's a variety of cases here. A 57-year-old female who had ischemic heart disease, a 43-year-old man with hypertrophy, and a 16-year-old boy who had idiopathic VF and his first cardiac arrest occurred four years before he had the device implanted. And all of these procedures were successful. Just trying to get the slide to move to the next one. I don't know if the... Uh Hopefully this program will wake up soon. I might just end the show and try and start it again. Sorry about this. Yeah. So this is the first ICD. It's quite a large device so big that it had to go into the abdomen, a subcutaneous implant, a very short battery life. R they estimated around three years, but really, in reality, it only lasted between one and two years. <coughs> and here we have a, a lead that went into the superior vena cava, and this is the defibrillation patch that went <coughs> on the external surface of the heart, and this required a thoracotomy for um, implantation. The first prototype even contained house, household electrical equipment, and you can see here common Duracell batteries that were used. But times have moved on since then. This is the initial ICD, no programming, 160 mils in volume. But ICDs today, much smaller, like this, much more sophisticated. So now they are all pectoral implants, unless there's a problem and the device has to go into the abdomen for technical reasons. The leads are endocardial, they're much smaller and thinner, and the programmability of the devices is much more sophisticated. Battery life is much longer, minimum now five years, but sometimes they can last more than 10 years, and they have advanced and powerful diagnostics. So what about the structure and function of the ICD? This is an exploded device, and basically it consists of a titanium can, and inside is the battery and the capacitor. The capacitor stores the charge, so when the device, the device charges, the charge is stored here, and then is discharged to the patient. And the battery and the capacitor are the two factors that determine the longevity of the device. <coughs> this is the circuit board that has all the hardware for, for programming. And then just the header box at the top where the leads are connected. And then more leads that you have, the bigger the header box and the bigger the size of the device. So it's not just a device. There's a lead as well. And really, the lead is the Achilles heel of the whole system. If the device is going to fail, it's usually the lead that's the problem. It has a silicone insulation and platinum-coated coils. And these coils here the places on the lead where the shock is delivered from. You can either have one coil distally, which goes into the right ventricle, or you can have two coils, and this more proximal coil sits in the superior vena cava. The conductors are down the middle of the lead, and these deliver the pacing impulses. And it's the insulation in the conductors that are the components of the lead that are most likely to fail. And the lead failure rate is not insignificant. It's a 2% per year lead failure rate, and this is higher in the pediatric population. The connection at the top, times have changed. In the past, we had three connectors, one for the pacing component of the lead, and then separate connectors for each coil. But now it's all been integrated into one easy-to-implant um, connection at the top. And this just goes nicely into the header box, which you can see at the top here. <coughs> 
and it's much more comfortable for the patient and it's much easier to implant because if you're the implanting physician and you've got this plus another two leads as well it's very easy to get the wrong pin in the wrong hole and then the device doesn't work properly and it's quite embarrassing but in terms of fixation <coughs> when you implant the tip of the lead into the right ventricle there are two ways that the lead can stay in situ this is a passive, a passive fixation lead which has these little plastic tines at the end this is more common just for a standard pacing lead. The vast majority of ICD leads use active fixation. And here you can see the helix at the end of the lead. This is not deployed. And when the lead is, when the lead is implanted into the right ventricle, the helix is literally screwed into the myocardium to fix it in place. This is a close-up of the coil. One of the problems that we have with the coil is that when it's been implanted in the heart for more than six months, the endocardium starts to grow over the lead and it can invaginate into the coil itself. And this is a big problem if we have to actually extract the lead. It makes the leads very difficult to extract. So one of the things that the manufacturers have started to do is coat the coil completely in Gore-Tex to try and make them easier to extract. So what about the function of ICDs? Well, they work as defibrillators, but they also work as pacemakers and they function as internal cardiac monitors. <coughs> and the sensing component of the lead is perhaps the most important aspect of, of the whole system. The lead, the device, has to be able to see the patient's heart rhythm. It has to see if the patient goes into VT or VF. It has to know what's going on. And what you see, this is a, a device that's got two leads. There's a lead in the right atrium, so this is the atrial channel, and there's a lead in the right ventricle, the ventricular channel. And this is what the device sees. These are intracardiac electrograms. And when you interrogate the device, you can also get a surface ECG printout corresponding to the intracardiac electrograms. But how does the ICD know whether the patient's in VT or not? Well, it's all based on calculations. And basically, the ICD calculates the RR interval, essentially the heart rate, and this is called the cycle length, and it's calculated in milliseconds. So you can see down here, this is the marker channel. VS means V-sense. It's sensing a ventricular complex, and it's calculating the interval between each complex so that it knows the heart rate. And that's basically how they work. In terms of pacing, you can pace different chambers of the heart depending on where you put the leads. You can just pace the right ventricle, so you only have one lead in the right ventricle. You can pace the right ventricle and the right atrium if this is needed for the patient, so two leads. And if the patient has heart failure, then you can also have a lead to pace the left ventricle, so biventricular pacing. So minimum of one lead, maximum of three. So what about therapies from the device then? Well, the ICD doesn't just shock the heart. There are two different therapies that the ICD can deliver. The first one is called anti-tachycardia pacing, or ATP. This is also known as overdrive pacing. And the second more common therapy that, you, you're, that you'll know about is the actual shock itself, or the shock therapy. So how does ATP work? Well, anti-tachycardia pacing is based on the ventricular tachycardia cycle length. So essentially, the heart rate when the heart goes into ventricular tachycardia. And what happens, you can see here, this is a printout from a, from a patient that goes into VT. So here the patient's in sinus <coughs> rhythm. This is the ventricular channel. And here, the ICD is calculating that the cycle length is 630 milliseconds. Okay, and here you can see the patient goes into VT. And now the cycle length is 300 milliseconds. And essentially, a cycle length of 300 milliseconds is a VT heart rate of 200 beats per minute. So what the device does, it will only do what you program it to do. It's as simple as that. It doesn't, it doesn't have a mind of its own. You have to program the device. So when you're programming ATP, you program the ATP to be delivered at a faster heart rate than the VT itself, but you don't know what the VT heart rate is going to be, so you have to deliver it at a percentage of the VT heart rate. So you tell the device, if the heart goes into VT, 
then I want you to pace the heart rate a cycle length that's 88% or 86% or 80% shorter. So for example, if the VT is 200 beats per minute and you've programmed ATP at 88%, then the ATP will be delivered at just over 225 beats per minute. And that's how the device works. And if you make this number lower, it makes the ATP more aggressive. So you can program the device to do whatever you want it to do. Usually, we, use, we just pace eight paced beats. So the heart goes into VT, the device detects it, and delivers eight paced beats. But you can also use ATP when the device is charging in readiness to deliver a shock. And the important fact about ATP is that if it's successful, which it usually is, then it avoids the need for the patient to have a shock. And this is what it looks like. So here, this is the ventricular channel. The patient's gone into VT, and it's detected by the uh, device. And the cycle length here is 250 milliseconds, which is a VT rate of 240 beats per minute. Here, you can see ATP is delivered, eight pace beats. And the rate is 270 beats per minute, which is 88% of the VT cycle length. And the cardioversion is successful. No need for a shock. The second type of, shock, uh, of therapy that the uh, defibrillator can give is a shock. And the shock is delivered from the coil, as I mentioned earlier. So here, this is the distal coil in the right ventricle. And it's the depolarization wave travels to the device which sits at the top, which we call the CAN. The charge time. When the device is brand new, it's about eight seconds. As the device gets older, the charge time increases. And once the device is at the end of its life, it probably takes about 12 seconds to fully charge. Most devices now, we just use high energy. You can program uh, lower energies, but we prefer not to do that. We, we just go straight in with a 35 joule shock just to give us the best safety margin possible. It's a biphasic high voltage waveform. And what you have to realize is that every time the patient receives a shock from the device, or every time the device is fully charged, it reduces the battery life by around one month. So as I said before, the device will only do what we program it to do. And we program therapies according to heart rate zones, basically. You can have up to three therapeutic zones. And in order for a patient to receive a therapy from the device, the heart rate has to fall within one of these zones. You may say, OK, so what happens if the athlete is training, they're playing football, they're running very fast, they, they mount a sinus tachycardia of 190, 180 beats per minute. Will they get shocked for that? Well, it depends on how the device is programmed. If the therapeutic zone has a low threshold, 170 beats per minute, then yes, they're at risk of getting an inappropriate shock. So how do we avoid this? Well, the device is also, um, it also contains discriminators to try and distinguish between ventricular tachycardia and non-ventricular tachycardia. One of the discriminators is heart rate. And as I've mentioned, you need to program a high threshold for younger patients. Another discriminator is morphology. The device can look <coughs> at normal sinus rhythm. It can take a template of the complex morphology at the time of implant. And it can learn to recognize the patient's normal sinus rhythm. And this can help to discriminate between a narrow complex sinus tachycardia and an abnormal ventricular arrhythmia. We also look at the onset of the arrhythmia. So for example, sinus tachycardia, you don't normally go from 60 beats per minute to 160 beats per minute, okay? Sinus tachycardia is a gradual onset. Whereas ventricular tachycardia, you can be sitting at rest, heart rate of 80, and then suddenly you go into VT, heart rate of 200. So the device looks at the onset of the arrhythmia. Is it sudden or is it gradual? And it also looks at the stability of the RR interval or the distance between each heartbeat. So for example, in atrial fibrillation, which can be conducted at rapid rates, the heartbeat is very irregular, so the RR interval is all over the place, whereas in ventricular tachycardia, it tends to be very stable. So these are the discriminators that de the device will use to try and avoid giving an inappropriate shock. And we have to program the device specific for each patient. You don't just give the same programming for every single patient because patients have different needs. And this is very, very important in minimizing inappropriate shocks. So this is a patient in sinus rhythm. They go into VT. 
But here we only have eight, pa eight, eight beats of ventricular tachycardia. And sometimes this can terminate on its own. So you don't want to deliver a shock for this. You want to wait. So the device is programmed to wait. And you may tell the device, OK, don't deliver a therapy until there's been 20 beats of VT or 30 beats of VT or 20 seconds or whatever you want to program. And then when you're happy and the, and the uh, criteria have been reached for delivery of a therapy, then the shock's delivered and the patient goes back into sinus rhythm. The implantation procedure itself, the number, the number of leads determines the complexity and the duration of the procedure, and it's basically the same as a pacemaker implantation. It takes about an hour to do if it's only one lead. You need x-ray guidance, and sometimes we test the device at the end. The patient has to stay in hospital overnight, but they're usually discharged home the following day for follow-up later in the device clinic. And we put these devices in under local anesthetic, sometimes with sedation if needed. The device goes in the, um, just below the left, cl left clavicle. We usually put them in on the left side in the vast, vast majority of cases. Infiltrate with local anesthetic. Then we start to make the pocket. And really, it's basically just blunt dissection down to the, um, through the subcutaneous tissues down to the surface of the pectoral muscles. Vascular access is obtained. And once you've got a guide wire in the, v in the target vessel where you're going to put the lead, you have to make the pocket. And this is probably it's the most uncomfortable part of the procedure basically it's blunt dissection and in order to make a pocket big enough for the to house the device you have to get the whole length of two or three fingers underneath the patient's chest to make a pocket big enough it's not very nice then you put the lead in under x-ray guidance this is a dual coil lead and here in the SVC is one coil and here in the right ventricle is the second coil and then you deploy the helix. So here you can see the screws deployed and the leads implanted into the right ventricle. You suture the lead in place and then you suture the pocket and that's what it looks like at the finish or it should look like at the finish if it's gone well. Sometimes, as I mentioned before, we do test the device. In the past, we used to test all devices at implantation but now we only do this in certain cases. If the patient's having a device implanted because they've already had a cardiac arrest, so this is secondary prevention, then we will test the device to make sure it's working. If the patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then we will test the device because the, sometimes patients with HCM are difficult to defibrillate because of the mass of the left ventricle. And also, if it's a right-sided implant. And basically, we put the patient into VF. We wait for the device to detect the VF. We wait for the device to charge and then we wait for successful defibrillation. So it's, it's quite a tense moment in the uh, cath lab when you're doing this. This is what it looks like on the chest x-ray afterwards. Here you can see the coils. The, lead is, the entire lead is radiopaque and the coils even more so. So you can always recognize a defibrillator lead from a pacemaker lead because of the presence of these coils, either one coil or two coils. And then this is how we interrogate the device. It's done remotely, so you just put a wand over the device itself. It's a non-invasive procedure, and it communicates with the computer here, and you can see the marker channels and the surface ECG. <coughs> this is what it looks like afterwards. And in terms of long-term follow-up, patients now are monitored at home. So they have, um, they have a device at their bedside which communicates with the ICD every night. And every night, data is sent to the hospital. And every morning, the technicians come in and they check the downloads from all the patients to make sure there's been no therapies, that there's no problems with the leads. And this has really revolutionized the follow-up of ICD patients. It means that they don't have to come to hospital all the time and it's greatly improved their quality of life. We can get data about therapy episodes, about the burden of non-sustained VT, which could be a, a harbinger of further problems. We can get pacing and sensing parameters from the lead, and we know how long the battery has left, so we can schedule the patient to come in for box changes. So it's, it's really revolutionized the follow-up of these, of these people. So what about indications for implantation then? Well, the indications for ICDs in athletes are the same as the indications for athletes in the general population. They're no different. If you've had an aborted sudden death episode, or if you've had hemodynamically sustained 
hemodynamically significant sustained VT. These are the two main indications. And this is the most recent um, guidance that was published in 2013. But obviously, the athletic population will have a, a different burden of disease than the more elderly patients that more commonly have ischemic heart disease. So the commonest reasons why athletes may have an ICD are the following. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and here you can see the typical ECG changes with inferior and lateral T-wave inversion. These patients are at risk of ventricular arrhythmia. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. This is a cardiomyopathy that affects the right ventricle and is characterized by fibrofatty infiltration. And here you can see characteristic ECG changes, this time in the right ventricular lead, with T-wave inversion, amongst other changes. And then we have the ion channelopathies. And perhaps most commonly in athletes of the ion channelopathies will be long QT syndrome, which you can see here. <coughs> and we should emphasize that the mainstay of treatment for long QT syndrome is actually beta blockers rather than an ICD. Beta blockers are very effective in treating this, but some patients do go on to have an ICD implanted. And sometimes also Brugada syndrome. Really, an ICD is the only effective treatment. There's no known treatment for Brugada syndrome. But sometimes things can go wrong. We can get complications of ICDs in non-athletes and in athletes. We can get complications arising from the therapy itself, and we can get complications arising from the components of the ICD. We know that anti-tachycardia pacing, if it's too aggressive, can accelerate the arrhythmia. So here, the patient is in fast VT. <coughs> the device delivers a, a short burst of ATP, a very aggressive type of ATP, and you can see immediately the rhythm degenerates into ventricular fibrillation. And so the patient then goes on to receive a shock. Also, we can get inappropriate shocks. So the patient receives a shock when they don't need one. This can be because they've gone into sinus tachycardia and somebody hasn't programmed the device properly, or they've had a supraventricular arrhythmia and the device doesn't recognize it as being a narrow complex tachycardia. If you have a problem with the lead, then this can cause an inappropriate shock as well. And inappropriate shocks really make patients' lives a misery. I had a patient who fiddled with her device and the lead, the right ventricular lead came back to the tricuspid valve annulus and because it was detecting all the motion of the tricuspid valve, it just kept shocking her. It thought the patient was in VF and she had 61 inappropriate shocks before she came to hospital and we just had to turn the device off. We can get complications related to the implant procedure itself and the complication rate, if it's, again, more leads, more complications. If it's a single lead, complication rate is probably about 1%. But they're not insignificant. Cardiac tamponade is rare. Failed defibrillation testing, it does happen. Arrhythmia is quite common. You can get any arrhythmia when you're putting leads inside the patient's heart. You can put the patient into asystole, atrial fibrillation, you can induce VT or VF just by putting the lead into the right ventricle. Here's a chest x-ray of a patient that's had a right-sided implant and there's a big pneumothorax here. And this will be <coughs> from vascular access. Sticking the needle in here, trying to get into the subclavian vein, the lung goes down. You can also see just about, this is the tip of the lead and it's displaced. It should be here and it's come back to the tricuspid valve annulus. Pocket complications can occur, hematoma. If the patient develops a swelling over the device, don't stick a needle in it because this will significantly increase the risk of infection. The way that we manage these is we just wait for them to settle down and if they don't settle down, they need to be evacuated surgically. In terms of what can happen with athletes, you can minimize the risk of trauma to the device by wearing um, protective, protective clothing. And really, we, we don't advise contact sports like American football if you've got a device in situ because the risk to the device is just too high. Another way to negate the risk of a, a pocket complication is to put the device beneath pec major. So this is a, called a submuscular pocket and you just divide pectoralis major and put the device underneath and this affords the device more protection. Infection is perhaps the most feared complication of ICDs, and the mortality rate, if it's untreated, is very, very high. 
Even if we take the device out and give systemic antibiotics, the mortality rate is still almost 20%. And if the device gets in infected, the whole thing has to be removed. The lead, the device, everything has to come out. And you can't use that side of the chest again. And every time we open the pocket, whether it's for a box change, whether it's for a lead repositioning or a replacement or any system revision, you increase the risk of infection. And this is why device longevity is so important. If you imagine an 18 year old football player has an ICD implanted, that device is only going to last eight, 10 years maximum. So he's looking at a number of procedures over his lifetime. So the manufacturers are always trying to increase the longevity of the device to minimize the number of procedures that the patient has to have. And it can look like this, just with skin retraction. Sometimes the skin erodes completely and you can see components of the device underneath and eventually the whole thing starts to extrude. We can get complications from the lead. The veins into which you implant the leads can block off, the leads can become displaced and you can get damage to the lead components. And if this happens, then the ICD won't work properly. <coughs> These are venograms of a 20-year-old patient with congenital comp complete heart block that had multiple procedures over their short lifetime. And here you can see both subclavian veins are blocked. You can't put a pacing lead down either of these, and even the superior vena cava is blocked. So the only option for this patient is to have an abdominal implant. So again, devices are implanted at a young age, you have to bear all of these complications in mind. Leads can displace. This is the tip of the right ventricular lead that's perforated through the myocardium. This can cause tamponade, hemoneumothorax. And this is twiddler syndrome. This is a recognized medical condition. You implant the device and the patient won't <coughs> stop playing with it. They fiddle with it. They can even rotate it in the pocket. And the leads displace and this is what happens to the leads. They all get twisted up. Subclavian crush injury, where the leads pass beneath the um, clavicle and they pass through the costoclavicular li ligament and over time the leads get damaged and they get crushed and then you get inappropriate shocks from the device. And if something goes wrong, as I said, the device has to be extracted. And this is a high-risk procedure, a very high-risk procedure. Major complication rate of up to 5%, including death. You can avulse the myocardium and cause tamponade. You can lacerate the venous system. The patient has to have a stenotomy, otherwise they bleed out on the table. And sometimes you have to pull so hard on these leads to get them out that you can involute the right ventricle. <coughs> and what happens afterwards is the device is successfully extracted, but the patient develops intractable right heart failure. And I've seen one case of this where the device came out, but the patient died of right heart failure two weeks later. Many of the problems that we get with ICDs arise from the leads themselves within the vascular system. And with this in mind, a new device was developed in 2009. This is an entirely sub subcutaneous system. So the device sits on the left lateral chest wall and the lead, it doesn't go into the veins at all. Normally the lead would come here and down into the heart. But here, the lead is entirely subcutaneous, and it just picks up a surface ECG. So this is much better for the pediatric population who are growing, who will outgrow their leads and their device over time. The only thing you have to bear in mind is that it cannot pace the heart. It will only deliver percutaneous post-shock pacing. So you can't use ATP in these, in these devices. So what about guidelines for participation in sport? Well, the guidelines that we use, the Bethesda guidelines, these are now 10 years old, and they're very strict. They advise that for athletes with ICDs, all moderate and high-intensity sports are contraindicated, which means they can only really do billiards, bowling, curling. And the main concerns that we have for ICDs in athletes are that the, a the athlete may get damaged to the device which could lead to device malfunction as a result of their sporting activity. Or well, the device might not work during exercise. They've never been formally tested during exercise. Or the athlete could get an injury resulting from a blackout whilst they're participating in sport. But the athletes and the cardiologists, I have to say, have ignored this advice. And over the last 10, 11 years, there's a number of athletes who've gone on to continue their professional or recreational sporting activities
successfully with ICDs in situ. And so the results of a registry were published in 2013, looking at how safe it is for athletes to participate in sport with ICDs in situ. And these people, the, the authors looked at 372 athletes with ICDs, median age 33, and these were the commonest sports. The diagnoses of these athletes were mainly long QT syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and ARVC. And the athletes were followed up over three years. And the primary endpoint was death due to tachyarrhythmia or an externally resuscitated cardiac arrest, i.e. the device has failed to, to work or injury resulting from an arrhythmia or a shock administered during exercise. And these were the results. None of the athletes had a primary endpoint. And during the time of the study, 121 shocks were delivered. So 21% of the subjects received a shock. Shocks were more common during physical activity versus at rest. But actually, there was no difference in the number of shocks reported during training versus recreational sporting activity. And all defibrillation therapies were successful. There were no injuries, no, damages, no cases of damage to the, to the device. And there was no significant increase in the uh, rate of lead malfunction. So 97% of athletes were free from lead malfunction five years post implant, which is as good as the general population, the non-athletic population. So if we go back to the team doctor's um, thoughts about Fadiger, the football player who had his ICD implanted in 2004, it's a device that can stop just as easily as it can start. Well, not really. If it gets hit by a ball, it will stop working and lead to his instant death. Not really. So if you have an athlete with an ICD, what do you need to know? You need to have a basic understanding of the athlete's cardiac condition. Okay? You don't need to know everything about it, but you basically need to know why the device is implanted and what the specific risks are for that athlete. You need to know about any medication that they're taking, especially if they've got long QT syndrome, so that you know about drugs to avoid. You should, it's good practice, to keep a copy of their ICD identification card on file and have the contact details of their local cardiologist or device clinic so that you can contact them if, if there's a concern. And you need to make sure that the athlete keeps regular follow-up. Don't refer the athlete for an MRI without liaising with the device clinic. MRIs are possible to have with an ICD in situ, but it depends very much on the type of ICD and the type of lead that you've got. If you're worried about the device, if you think there's been direct trauma as a result of sporting activity, or you think the device, the pocket may be swollen, or there may be early signs of infection, then don't delay. Refer the patient immediately. Don't do anything to the pocket. Don't stick a needle in it. Don't give them antibiotics. Just send them straight to the device clinic. And if you have an athlete that receives a shock, don't allow them to resume their activity. They must be transferred to hospital. It could be an appropriate shock, in which case their antiarrhythmic medication may need to be adjusted, or it could be an inappropriate shock, in which case the device may need to be reprogrammed. What happens if the device doesn't work? Well, this is a very, very rare scenario, but it theoretically could happen. <coughs> if the patient goes into VT or VF, the device, will, the device will deliver a shock. If the shock doesn't work, the device will shock again but it will not keep shocking the patient indefinitely. There's a maximum number of shocks that the device will deliver for each arrhythmic episode, and it's usually no more than eight. If the athlete collapses on the pitch, check for the pulse and call for the AED. By the time the AED is on the pitch, the device will usually have worked already. You can give CPR if there is a device in situ. It's completely safe, and you shouldn't delay effective CPR if the patient requires it. If the device doesn't work and you need to use an AED, what do you do? Well, the first thing is if you have a patient with an ICD, then you have to have an AED available at all times. If you need to use the AED, then you need to place the pads at least 10 centimeters away from the device. And usually we recommend antero-posterior positions or biaxillary positions for the pads themselves. 
So in summary, we think now it is safe to participate in sport if you have an ICD in, in situ. The Bethesda guidelines that I referred to that were published in 2005 are currently being rewritten and we think that they will relax the current restrictions. So it's likely that in the future there will be an increase in the number of athletes with an ICD. And I would say that it's important to understand how the ICDs work and how we can safely manage an athlete with an ICD in order that they can continue their sporting activity. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the athletes screening department, especially the nurses who are the backbone of our department. And I'd like to take any questions. Thank you.